Hi everyone, my name is Kyra Santos. I am 19 years old and I live in Virginia. Here's why I'm taking action for menstrual health equity. Everyone deserves to be comfortable in their own bodies. When my friends and I began a She's the First chapter at Singapore American School, we made a conscious effort to discuss social justice issues such as menstrual equity that our peers may have not considered in the past due to cultural stigma. It was one of the first social justice issues I talked about openly in front of my peers. And I felt a sense of empowerment in that because I was helping to change people's feelings and thoughts around menstruation. I started my period at 11 years old and starting young made me feel isolated. My friends did not get theirs until years later. Even though I knew it was something that my friends and I would all experience eventually, it was lonely. When I got to my sophomore year of high school, I noticed that there was more articles and social media posts regarding menstruation and breaking down period stigma. Then I read an article on NPR about how 2015 was considered the year of the period, and I was shocked at how openly people were online were discussing periods. I was inspired, so for the persuasive essay unit in my English class, I wrote about how the pink tax in the U.S. should be abolished. It made me feel more comfortable as a young teen to see so many people dive into the conversation, and I intended to do so through the essay and ultimately when I started the She's the First chapter on my campus. When I was 18, I was a member of the Child and Youth Program, or CYP Teen Center, which is a community center for children of U.S. Navy personnel in the U.S. and overseas. In my last year as a member, I learned that the CYP had done service projects within the military and the local community, but they had never considered a donation drive specifically for menstrual products. I decided to organize a drive for Star Shelter, which is a temporary refuge center for women and children in Singapore. The families who stay in the shelter are often victims of domestic violence. After getting permission to donate products to the shelter, I went ahead with planning the logistics. Ultimately, the project fell through due to a legal conflict, but I was still so proud of all the progress we had made. Talking about menstruation openly was not something that people working on the project were used to. I took the time to approach conversations by asking questions. For example, I would ask adults, in addition to non-perishable food, clothing, books, and other items, have you ever considered donating menstrual products to shelters? Every adult I asked had never done so, and more often than not, they never even considered it. These questions led to realizations that we could discuss together. What I was grateful for was that those involved in the project really took time to listen and learn about the importance of menstrual equity. I think part of the reason that these conversations worked out was because I was enthusiastic about the issue and I approached it with a question that could kickstart a meaningful conversation. The conversations we had about the importance of menstrual equity were such a game changer for all of us because we can't achieve menstrual equity through staying silent due to the uncomfortable nature of the topic. This issue of menstrual equity is important to me because I've come to learn and understand how detrimental it is to menstruators all around the world when they can't obtain menstrual products. Everyone deserves to be comfortable with their own bodies. And I feel like many people may not consider the correlation between this and having access to menstrual products. This issue also signifies a generational and a cultural shift that is occurring for the betterment of society. Slowly but surely, people are having conversations that are equally important as they are uncomfortable. I'm excited to keep talking. Now, I would like to bring back Kristen Brandt, co-founder and chief programs officer at She's the First, who is now going to tell us more about why menstrual equity is critical to girls' rights. Thank you, Kira, and thanks for kicking off day two of our week of action. And for everyone else, welcome back. I'm psyched to be here with you for our first real day of taking action. So let's talk periods. When I was 12 was when I got mine. And my mom is a nurse, which makes me really lucky because it means I got all of the information I needed. And I mean all of the information I needed. I was absolutely that nine-year-old at the back of the school bus explaining to all of my friends what a fallopian tube was, and I am sure their parents hated me. <laughs> but a few years later, my periods, they suddenly just stopped. And when I went to the doctor, they put me on hormonal birth control to get them started again, which worked, but every so often it would stop working and I would have a ton of pain with my periods and the doctors couldn't figure out what was going on. 
And so eventually, about 13 years later, the pain got so bad and so intense that I had trouble working, exercising, thinking. And it took more than a decade of period problems for me to get the information I needed from doctors and for them to realize that I had endometriosis, which is a disease in which your uterine cells grow outside of the uterus. They cause a lot of pain. It's a big mess. But I bring up this story because all across the world, women and girls and people who menstruate are left with this huge knowledge gap all about our bodies and about the way they work. And it starts with our education about menstrual health. At She's the First, we believe that girls have a right to knowledge about their own bodies and that girls deserve all of the products necessary to live a life of dignity. That's why we work with partners globally to ensure that girls get the holistic education that they need. They have the mentors to walk them through all of their questions and concerns. And sometimes even that isn't enough. Some of you might remember the story of Dorcas and Esther, which we first told about three years ago. There are two students in Uganda who kicked off their own community project because they wanted to tackle both this, uh, the issue of the lack of product that was available, as well as the lack of education that women and girls in their community were getting. And they knew that it was a problem because not only were they, many of their community members, not able to afford these products, but because a lot of times their friends and their sisters were using things like used or dirty rugs or other clothing items or even tree bark. And of course, using all of those products led to infections, but infections are associated with sex, so they didn't want to go to the clinic to get it treated. And it was this whole cycle where the health of these girls and women were being really impacted. And so Dorcas and Esther wanted to break that cycle. So they started small and with support from She's the First and from their school, Arlington Junior School, they put together a project where they could teach how to make pads for people who couldn't afford them. And while they were doing that, they talked about the health and hygiene information that people needed to know. So I think we have a quick video that we can show you about that project. To be a leader because I want to see change in my community. It also gives me a chance to speak out my mind on things which are not right. I want to be a leader because I want to empower fellow girls with skills like Take for example, Esther and I are holding a workshop to empower fellow girls on skills in making reusable pads. Some girls in our community cannot afford to buy pads from shops and clinics, but these reusable pads made with our hands are affordable. I think there will be no more using of clothes to prevent the flow of the hands. Since it's easy to learn, the girls we teach go in the community and they make their own workshops and train like their mothers and other little girls on how to make cheap pads. In future, I want to be the head teacher and advise girls to also work hard not to leave boys to be in front of them. In the future, I want to emulate my role models, she's the first. And I want to run an organization to raise money to support girl child education. So that's actually the first time I've watched that video in, in quite a while. And like I said, this project that they did, they actually started it three years ago. And Today, both Dorcas and Esther are in secondary school and they're wildly confident. Uh, and I think it relates directly back to what Cairo is talking about, about not being afraid to have these conversations, like not letting the, this perceived shame around period and period stigma get to us and, and instead to stand up and to talk about it. And Dorcas and Esther did that even before, I mean, Esther at that point has shared that she hadn't even had her first period yet, but she was standing up and she was talking to girls about the information that they needed to know 
to stay hygienic, to keep themselves healthy. And I think having that kind of courage is really important if we want to break period stigma. So meanwhile, you might have also read in your action guide today, Deepa's narrative about her first period in Nepal. And Deepa wrote about a tradition that takes place in some communities where people who are menstruating are asked to stay outside of the family home. And they're not allowed to come in to sleep. They're not allowed to touch food. Um, they're really not allowed to participate in family life in a meaningful way until after they're no longer bleeding and they're considered clean. And that's a practice that has led to deaths, actually, of many women because of either cold temperatures, sometimes animals. Um, you know, the, the shame and the stigma around periods are just so out of control in so many places. And over the course of a person's lifetime, what we know is that someone who's menstruating is going to use upward of 17,000 tampons or pads if they're able to afford them. And, you know, we talk about kind of shame and stigma and periods all over the all over the world. But here in the U.S., menstruating people spend more than two billion dollars on period products each year. But we have 12 million girls, women and trans folk who live under the poverty line and many of them can't afford these products even though they need them. So for the nearly 500 million people globally experiencing period poverty that don't have access to these products, they're unable to manage their menstruation with dignity. We have one third of girls in South Asia who miss school during their period because of a lack of products. And we know that 32% of menstruating people in the US have missed school or work because of the pain that they're experiencing. A lot of times when we talk about period stigma, we talk about period poverty, we talk about these things, we often talk about it wrapped up in this idea that if only girls and women had access to pads, if only they had access to tampons, then we would make sure that girls are in school. And if they go to school and they graduate, it increases the GDP. And we kind of create this argument around why girls and women deserve pads. And what I would challenge you to do in some of your conversations about period poverty is to remember that period poverty is about dignity. Having access to pads, to tampons, to supplies that you need to stay healthy, to stay clean, it's not about your country's GDP. It's not about what you bring to society when you have those products. It's about the fact that we all deserve to be clean. We all deserve to be able to take care of our bodies in that way. And it's a human rights issue. It's an issue of dignity. And given all of these impacts of a period on your day-to-day -day life, is it really so much to ask that these products be accessible to us, that they be affordable, that women, that all menstruating people are able to manage those periods with dignity? We think so. So we've talked a lot about how all this week you're going to be thinking about your long-term actions, your short-term actions, global actions, local actions. How do you combine all of these things together to create those impact plans? Remember those slips that you had yesterday with your, your commitments. So when we think about long-term actions that you can take with period equity or really with any big issue, what I want you to do is think about the systems that have produced that problem. So when it comes to period inequity, what do we mean? What are we talking about? What actually creates period inequality throughout the world? So first and foremost is poverty, right? If you can't afford the products, you can't get the products and then you're in this situation. Another though is patriarchy, which really kind of lends itself to this conversation around women's issues being something other, something you don't talk about, something that's quiet, something that's shameful. And hand in hand with that is lack of education because the less that you know about your own body and the less that you know about what is normal and what are your rights, the harder it is for you to tackle this issue, either on a, a personal or a systemic level. Okay, so once you've identified what are the systemic reasons or the root causes of this issue that I'm looking at, you can start to look for actions that will help you work on those big, big root causes. So with period inequity, you might start to work with others in your community to convince your school or your local district to provide pads and tampons for free you might work to ensure that you've got a comprehensive menstruation education program running either in schools or after school, whatever makes sense for your community. 
And like Kyra, you can't be afraid to normalize talking about periods. So we are making progress. In 2018, Scotland became the first country in the world to make sanitary products free to students at all schools, colleges, and universities. We've got countries such as India, Australia, Kenya, Canada, Ireland, and they've gotten rid of all of those taxes typically added onto sanitary products. And on the note of taxes, our guest today is Laura Strasfeld, who was instrumental in eliminating the tampon tax in New York State. And she's currently working on achieving the same in many more states throughout the U.S. through the organization she co-founded, Period Equity. So we are so excited to talk to you. Hi, Laura. Hi. Great to be here. Thanks so much, Kristen. Yeah, we're so excited to have you and to learn more from you. So to start, do you want to just tell us a bit more about the work of Period Equity and your own work through the years? Sure. Um, and I, I want to say that... Um, I, I was thinking about speaking to a lot of young people and the organization run by young people. I started thinking about these issues when I was your all of your age. And, and in fact, I was a first year law student uh, in at Columbia University in New York and moved to New York for the first time. And that's when I discovered the tampon tax. Um, I'll also say that I, uh, Kristen, like you, my dad was a gynecologist, a doctor. And um, so I grew up with no stigma in my <laughs> You got the same talk I got. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm often forgetting that, oh, people don't talk about this um, so easily. And I have some suggestions for the stigma. We can talk about that later, but I period equity, um, came out of 30 years of thinking about, and actually um, having researched the law about the tampon tax, realizing there was a good lawsuit, very good legal claim to make in New York. And I tried to get it filed 30 years ago, but finally the lawsuit we were able to file in 2016. And the reason for that is that, as you were saying, Kristen, if you don't look systemically at what's causing these issues, um, you can't really make change. I, I began working in 2016 with Jennifer Weiss Wolf because she uh, was writing publicly um, about menstrual equity and actually coined the term menstrual equity. So, uh, you know, if I had tried to file a lawsuit 20 years earlier, maybe it wouldn't have gone anywhere because people at that time were less willing than they are now to talk about menstruation and menstrual equity. So we um, are both lawyers and we teamed up because there are a lot of other uh, legal claims to be made about the sales tax on, menst on menstrual products, which we have argued in court is unconstitutional, and also about period poverty that, um, especially with education and girls in school, that it's unfair for um, girls not to, and people, and you know, anyone who menstruates, um, to not have the supplies they need to um, stay in the classroom for the entire lesson, or even to come to school and not have to miss school because they have their period. It's not. It's a violation of um, Title IX. So we we have a lot of ways that we can use the law. Uh, in dealing with um, menstrual equity issues, which also include the safety of period products as well. So that's what period equity does. We're actually the only um, litigation law and policy organization doing this now, and I hope there will be more, but it's just us for right now. Well, and I love the phrase, uh, it looked like a great lawsuit. Like I think <laughs> for those out there who are either working toward your law degree or thinking about a law degree, um, I think you're gonna learn a lot from from Laura throughout this conversation. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of things in life that I feel like, particularly when it comes to the patriarchal systems, where it's like that that feels like a good lawsuit. Like why are why are we not why are we not on that? <laughs> so I love that that's one of the reasons and one of the the ways that period equity took off. And I do I do want to go back to this concept you brought up about period stigma. And so let's talk about 
talking about periods. Um, this is something that often is kind of put in the corner, like it's a women's issue or it's a girl's issue. I remember growing up and reading magazine articles and they would have those sections about, you know, people write in their most embarrassing moments. And inevitably there was always one about somebody bled through their jeans or somebody got their period in gym class. And, you know, it would have the like, four frowny faces next to it because it was so embarrassing that they they bled through their jeans. And I it's just so entrenched in our culture that having your period is something you should be quiet about. And so I am curious to hear, you know, what what are some of the ways that we can reduce stigma around periods? What are the ways we can get more comfortable talking about this? You know, in some ways, I often think I'm the worst person to ask about this because, like I said, I, you know, that I just, I'll talk to anyone about menstruation, but maybe there's some insight there is that I've done that for so many years that um, if you start doing it, you, you feel more free to do it more. Um, in having any kind of discussions with people that make you uncomfortable. I've often often found that it's good to rehearse, to literally like stand mm -hmm. in front of the mirror and think through what you might say to someone. I really encourage all of you to speak to boys and men about menstruation. One of the things I have found in the work that I've done with period equity over the last four years is I am speaking to grown men, legislators around the country, lawmakers, and they have no idea what menstruation is. In fact, this is graphic. Of course, I have no problem with this. Um, and, um, and I can't see your faces either, so, so no worries here. But I realized that I think that men, a lot of men, because they really learn nothing from, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know where they're learning about menstruation. And I taught my son what menstruation is, that they don't understand the non-voluntary nature of it you know that um, that you you don't it's not like bladder control or um so you know once you explain to man especially in new york city when we were talking about you know women need these products these are people who are riding the subways and sharing yeah. you know subway chairs and bus seats with you they were sort of like take all the supplies you need <laughs> um, you know, I was basically describing the idea of flow to to men who really didn't understand that, you know, women don't often know when their periods are coming. Um, they don't know how heavy they'll be. Um, and, and certainly, you know, you it, it's there's a piece of it that only if you've experienced it, it seems so natural for um, us who have menstruated to understand this. But you can understand that 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 men might not get this unless someone tells them. So I, um, I challenge all of you to bring up, you know, the, the issue of the tampon tax, because that seems like a good gateway conversation for people to have. Did you know that these products, which are actually medical necessities, according to the American Medical Association, and of course, all of us, um, are, are taxed in now 30 states uh, in 2016, there were 40 states, so we're slowly um, trying to, you know, help states get rid of this. And I hope all of you will stay on this, um, you know, stay tuned because I, we really need your help. And what's amazing about um, the sort of phone calls and, and emails that we'll discuss in a few minutes is how effective they are. So I'm very excited. Um, to to get your help with that today. Yeah, and I we did have one of the comments come in on YouTube that um, somebody once heard a story about a woman whose boss thought she could control it. So just just stop, just don't have your period. It's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so true that not only you know not only are our boys not educated about periods and menstruation and and what that means and what that looks like. But there's a lot of default information that I feel like girls and women are taught about men and men's bodies and how they work. Yeah. And the reverse just, it's not there. Yeah. Um, so this concept, though, of period or menstrual equity, it, it has started gaining traction. We started talking about 
some of the countries that have started implementing better, stronger laws. Um, but why do you think that is, that this concept is finally starting to catch on a little bit? And can you tell us more about what's happening in the US on the kind of menstrual justice front? Well, to answer your first question, the reason we're gaining traction is because of young people like all of you who are, are really pushing themselves, challenging themselves to talk about it and um, post on social media about it, you know, being brave to break the stigma, especially in, in, in cultures that really push back against sharing uh, our, our stories, our, um, our medical needs. So it's been, it's been really um, very satisfying to do this work. And I think it also encourages more young people um, like Kyra to to do it because you see how effective you as a you know 16, 17, 21 year old can be. And and that's really because, you know, like I said, we're educating men, a lot of men who are um, still running states and municipalities and school districts around the country and, and also lawmakers around the world about what we need. So um, currently in the US because because um, we've, there are a lot of people involved in advocating for removing the tampon tax. We've, like I said, we've been able to push 10 states in four years to do it. And as you'll hear in a moment, there are three states that can really do this tomorrow, get rid of their um, sales tax on menstrual products. And, um, and all of you can help get that done. I think the more we coordinate both the advocacy, the media, and also the litigation, um, it really helps. And I should add that Period Equity filed a lawsuit last month in Michigan. And it's a class action lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the tampon tax there. And that gets other states worried. So it's a, it's a, you know, a tool that we're using now to push as hard as we can um, especially there, a lot of states are considering their budgets right now, and then we'll shut down for a couple months before January. And of course, all of us will be very um, understandably focused on the election. So this is sort of our, um, the window is closing to um, make a difference this year with the tampon tax, and then we'll get back to work in January. Well, I'm glad that our actions today are, are heavily tied into the tampon tax, and we're going to come back around to that in a minute. I do want to start us off at, we've talked a little bit about um, some of the long-term actions you can take being organizing within your own local community. So whether that's around access to product or what have you, and what I'm curious about are to hear your thoughts or stories you've heard or general thoughts on pushing for access to free product within the school or kind of workplace level. Because I think a lot about how oftentimes you go to school and your available product is like, you know, one of these machines from like the 1950s that you try to put quarters in. Now you have to find a quarter to pay for this stupid product if you have the quarters to begin with, either because you don't have loose change or you just don't have money to spare. Um, or maybe you're walking down the hall to go to the nurse, but now you have to go to the nurse three times a day to use her bathroom to get it. Like, it just feels like a ridiculous situation all around. And so I'm curious to hear from you, um, what are your thoughts on advocating or pushing for free product at the school level? Do you see a trend in that at all? Can we hope that that's on the horizon? Should people be pushing for that more? What are your, what is your advice, Laura? That's a great question and, um, and a great way to frame it because um, I can tell you now that we have the um, legal research done to, for all of you to say that it's against the law for states to not provide free menstrual products in every bathroom for people who need them, including gender neutral bathrooms, because of course, you know, it's not just girls who menstruate. So um, we, we have a strong argument that it's a violation of Title IX, as I said, because it denies girls equal access to education if they, they have to be interrupted 
to go to the nurse and then speak to a person to get a pad. Mm-hmm. Of course, if the schools don't even supply free products, um, then and if they end up staying home, that's even worse. So if you are in a school that is not providing products in every bathroom, you can, number one, just check to see that your state might actually have a law already um, mm-hmm. that, that um, schools need to have these products. Certainly in New York City, that's true. Um, number two, you can say that, you know, um, I know from Period Equity, the organization, that um, that it's against the law violation of Title IX, and why don't you just, um, before getting sued, provide these products in the bathrooms? <laughs> like, by the way, Principal, <laughs> this looks like a great lawsuit to me. <laughs> Um, but it's true, like, you know, many of these laws do exist on the books. And if you can find out what the laws are in your state, use that to your advantage. We also had a comment come in um, from Carly, who said, this conversation reminds me of the viral trend where girls ask boys to describe how pads are used, um, which it feels like it should be an additional action that we all have to take today is to ask one boy to describe <laughs> how is it that pads are used and and see what they come up with. Um, So Laura, I would love to hear when it comes to period equity, what are your long-term goals? What is your, you know, we've been talking a lot this week about our North stars, um, a vision of a world where kind of the issues that we're working on are solved. And so I'm curious to hear, you know, when you think about the work of period equity, what does your, Kind of grand vision look like? What is your ultimate goal? We, we like to say that the ultimate goal is to um, shut down period equity and become equity period because, um, you know, the menstrual equity issues are in our sights. We can make sure that no girls are missing school because they don't have access to menstrual products, um, that incarcerated people don't have to, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of issues with um, incarcerated women not having free access to products. It creates a lot of other um, concerns. Um, and so also in homeless shelters, those products should be freely provided. Domestic violence shelters, uh, everyone who needs products should have them. They should actually be free everywhere. Um, They also should be safe and made from ingredients and products that are transparent and that are safe for the environment and safe for our bodies. And um, certainly, obviously, we should not be a source of revenue for states. Um, Necessity products are generally exempt from tax. There are no prescription drugs that are taxed, including um, Viagra and Rogaine. And, you know, if those are more necessary than menstrual pads, then, you know, that that's just right. an insane world we're living in. Of course, we are living in an insane world, but um, that's upside down. We need to get rid of the tampon tax as soon as possible. And it does seem possible. And we need to, as I said, either by um, state laws or city laws, make sure that um, menstrual products are free in all schools, shelters, and prisons. And if not, we will try to sue um, these places to make sure that happens. And finally, we need regulation. We need better regulation of menstrual products. Um, I shouldn't say finally. We we also have a fourth mission in period equity, which is that we, we need comprehensive K through 12 sex mm-hmm. education that educates boys and, and all girls, not only about Uh, menstruation, but all menstrual health issues about endometriosis and other serious problems that people only learn about when they are, you know, end up um, personally experiencing it. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I think the, uh, the t-shirt to come out of all of this is going to be, I'm not your funding source, (laughs) ban the period tax. Yeah. Um, So, I am going to ask Laura about our actions for the day in just a minute. So as a reminder, if you have questions for Laura or for us about period equity, about any of these issues, about the actions that we're taking, 
please feel free to start dropping them into the chat now because we can get to any questions that you have just after this next section. Um, and I'm going to ask Laura to please walk us through our actions for today. And today's action, just as a reminder to everyone, this is really one of the most time sensitive actions that we're taking all week. And I'm sure Laura will stress this with us as well. Um, but this is definitely like your to do today action after this, after this broadcast, after this rally. So I'll hand it over to Laura to tell us more about what we're going to do today. What are, what are our big actions? Okay, so we have our sights on three states that still tax menstrual products. I just wanna say that, you know, having spoken for the last couple of years to a lot of legislators, lawmakers around the country, the number one thing they say moves them to take action is hearing not just from people, but from young people, uh, you know, people in their state, but also around the country. If they get a phone call or uh, an email, it, and even, even if this action, you know, um, yielded just a few or a dozen of these to the three people on our list, that would be, it would really make a difference. And I want you to watch the news after you do this action just um, keep your eye on the news in the next week. As I mentioned, Michigan is ending its budget session. They're discuss discussing the budget, including the tampon tax, up until their deadline of October 1st. So the pressure that you will put on Governor Gretchen Whitmer today by emailing her and calling her, and actually if you could do both, leave a message with Governor um, Whitmer and also email her, that would be amazing. And like I said, in Michigan, we filed a lawsuit there, but we know because we're lawyers that she has the authority to remove the tampon tax. There's a certain action she can take. She can do it yesterday. I hope she does it today after your calls and your emails. Um, Similarly, and this is kind of amazing, and you learn a lot about state law when you do advocacy work, Maine passed uh, eliminating the tampon tax. They had bills in the House and Senate, and everyone voted. I don't know if it was unanimous, but it, those bills passed. So we've been waiting around for the governor to sign it, but she has not signed it. She is the first female governor of Maine, she's a Democrat, but what? I think because she was elected in 2018, she's scared to sign this bill because it will, you know, take out a few hundred thousand dollars of the budget. She's under a lot of pressure, but uh, we support her and say, you can do this. Um, she was the first, she's the first female governor in her state. She has to lead. And um, I think a few phone calls and emails will really encourage her to do that. And then finally in Vermont, the legislature, because we've talked to a lot of people, we know that they are ready to pass a bill to get rid of the tampon tax. There is one woman who's holding this up and uh, she's Democrat. She was the first female head of a very powerful committee that deals with the budget in Vermont, the House Ways and Means Committee. So we feel a little bit of pressure on her, some phone calls and some emails encouraging her, please push this forward. And you may be asking, you know, why would she hold up on doing this? There, there are very few people who will go on record opposing, um, you know, or supporting the tampon tax. It's, it's always about, you know, we don't have the money. Well, mm -hmm. um, the states really need to get this together. You can't make money on a necessity. They don't do it for any other goods. And it's unconstitutional to make money from a necessity only used by women or half the population. So I'm, I'm so, I've been looking forward to this. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to really have a group of people, um, enthusiastically encourage these powerful women in their states to take action. 
Amazing. So those actions are in the action guides that you received this morning. You can chat about them with your action groups on WhatsApp. Um, I know that we have people representing Michigan here. I think we might also have Maine and Vermont. But regardless, whether these are your governors or not, Today is the day, get those emails out, get the phone calls out. There are, I believe that there are scripts also in those action guides, but. Sure, and you, you know, can modify them as well. You know, they're just suggestions, but we'll give you a little background. Can you tell us why, why would it be powerful to edit those, edit those guides or to make those guides your own? Because um, these emails are read, there are, people in positions who are just receiving communications. If you can imagine you're a state legislator, le legislator or a governor, you're elected to office, you really care what people are, what kind of feedback you're getting. So, and to have that personal, personalized for it, not just to come from, or look like it comes from a robot is really deeply meaningful. And it's an avenue, not just, um, for you to use in this action, but really for any issue you care about, to speak to your elected representative. They don't hear from enough people and they really appreciate it and actually listen. Mm -hmm. And I think for those of you who were taking action with us when, um, when we look to leave comments on new regulations about immigration and, and asylum laws, for those of you who are, who are here and who are taking action for that, you know, you'll remember that, um, really personalizing it is something that if you just scroll through the comments, actually not a lot of people do. And so if you can make it more about yourself, if you can relate to why this is such an important issue for you, um, or if you are a brilliant legal mind like Laura, you can connect it to various laws and, um, and law of the country. And all of these things make for really powerful persuasive arguments where when there are no comments, you know, our politicians don't really have any reason to think that people feel very passionately about it. So a big kind of um, reason for doing this is making sure that these women understand and know that we are passionate about it, that this is something that we do want to see change, that this is something we really, you know, we're going to fight for. So Laura, I do have a first question for you, which is after we take this action, after we kind of hit these three states, hopefully successfully, where do we go next to keep momentum going on the issue of period equity? Well, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll see results from this action today, but these three states maybe, you know, more than likely will, will keep their tampon tax on the books and start a new session in January. So targeting them again um, and as often as you can is a good idea. Um, there are, like I said, 30 states that still tax tampons. The period mm -hmm. equity website and taxfreeperiod.com, um, which is linked to on the period equity website, have um, other ways that you can get involved. You can, for example, through the tax free period website, buy a box of tampons or pads in your state and um, try to get a refund on your tax by claiming mm -hmm. that it's unconstitutional. And there, there's a way to do that on the tax-free period website. And, um, you know, we, we, we will call on you again for help. Uh, you won't, won't have to ask first. We'll probably ask you first to uh, <laughs> help us with this because like I said, I mean, it's, um, Period equity is small. We're just a couple of lawyers, but this is um, this is really. We'll see. This is an experiment. I think it's going to go really well. So we'll be back. I hope. <laughs> I hope so too. I think um, first of all, we'll all be filing our taxes differently. Those of us who do file, <laughs> um, and yeah, and very excited to keep pushing on this issue because it's something a lot of us feel very passionate about. I know we've got a couple of questions coming in in the chat. Maybe we can bring one of those up now. Yeah, so what are the best routes to forward this movement without being in the legal profession field? There's, there's no reason to be in the legal profession field to forward this. The um, Like I said, I mean, I had a lawsuit prepared 30 years ago. It was because people, young people started blogging about it, um, posting on social media. 
that stuff is so important, especially, like I said, to elected representatives and men who really don't understand menstruation and our needs. So the best route forward is um, reaching out to people who have power to make changes, either, you know, running your school, um, you know, uh, running a homeless shelter, um, and elected representatives who can help provide free products, help get rid of the tampon tax. And also, you know, we, we've been working on legislation to pass regulations for um, safety of, of menstrual products. Yeah, I think something that's really important to remember, especially, you know, everyone here today, we're all activists, we're all moving in some direction and pushing forward for change in some direction. And remember from our conversation yesterday that we talked about the fact that you are still one person and you don't have to do everything, right? You don't have to take on all of the all of the legalities of period equity in order to create progress within that issue area. So think about what you can do. Think about what is within your control. Think about the longer term actions you can take and the more immediate actions you can take like those we're doing today. And that's how you create this impact plan, this action plan that's going to be more sustainable over time. I know we have a few more questions in the chat, so let's do maybe one or two more from there. Let's see. What advice do you give to those outside of the US to start conversations on lifting taxes? I'm, I'm like I said, I'm, I'm so bad because I was lucky to have my dad, the doctor. I wonder, I, I challenge all of you to, you know, talk to a, a male relative. I don't I don't know if this is a crazy idea, but like, did you know that menstrual products are taxed across the U.S. and a lot of other countries? What do you think of that? And. And then they might say, well, you know, so toilet paper is taxed. And yeah, but, you know, um, everybody uses toilet paper. There, We do have a lot of information on the period website to sort of arm you for arguing this. Um, but I think the service you do to the men in your life, in your families who don't know about this is not just to educate them about the tax, but really to um, get them comfortable. Maybe often, you know, in, in some cases I've, I've experienced for the first time talking about menstruation. That, yeah. that might be, how challenging is that? Do you think, Kristen, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's a challenge worth worth taking up. And while you're at it, ask him how pads work and, and just see what he says. I don't know, see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. And everyone remember, if you are in the US, make your phone calls and write your messages to those three, um, to those three representatives and government, governors that we're talking about. Make sure that you do that soon because those deadlines are fast approaching and we can make a bigger impact if we're all doing this at the same time. And then if you are outside of the U.S., remember all of these other pieces we've been talking about today, like talking to your community members, organizing around your school or workplace, pushing for community level change, or even lobbying for change on a, on a bigger structural level, on a national level, on a district level. Um, you can do this too, and we can't wait to hear how that goes. So, Laura, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all so much and for what you're about to do. It's going to be very effective. Well, we can't wait to tell you. Can't wait to show you how it goes. So now I would love to bring Hannah Parikh back on. Hannah, you'll remember from yesterday, is our development and communications manager, runs our Instagram. She's the one you're talking to more than, more than anyone else when you talk to She's the First. So I will let her close out for the day. But thank you all so much for being here this hour. And and letting me talk about periods for an hour straight. I appreciate you all. Thanks, Kristen. Um, and to Laura for such an insightful conversation. There's so much I just learned. And as someone who has bought a ton of period products over the years because I have PMDD, um, I'm definitely going to be taking action alongside all of you as soon as we wrap up here. So. For a sneak peek at tomorrow, we're gonna to be covering climate justice and sustainability. Um, we know that climate change disproportionately affects girls and women. And with the recent global natural disasters that you've 
seen all over the news, it's never been more pressing. So luckily you can actually take um, an action brain early tomorrow. So many of you are familiar with Greta Thunberg and her international um, initiative called Fridays for Future. And so tomorrow is actually the global climate strike um, or the global day of climate action. Um, and so you can, after you take your priority equity action today, you can start prepping for tomorrow by checking out the website there. It will also be in your action guide. Um, so thank you so much for everybody who tuned in and who just made our first um, you know, focus areas so successful. So now it's time to go and take those actions, make those phone calls, send those emails. So you're going to look out for prompts coming from your action group leaders um, and next steps, as well as a survey where you can track your impact that you've been taking each day and help us tally the collective number of actions that we've taken together. So you'll wanna fill it out today, Friday and Saturday, um, so that on Sunday, we can accomplish everything that we've done and celebrate um, all the impact that we've made. So without any further questions, um, we'll see you again online on YouTube tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the 25th. All right, have a good day, everybody, and see you online to take some action. Bye.